All right, well, we're four beautiful black women that know a lot of stuff, so we'll just share what we know with you. Okay, I'm Gina Belafonte. I'm the co-director of Sankofa.org, which is an organization that is founded by my father, Harry Belafonte, and we create, thank you so much, thank you. We, um, we created this organization um, in the spirit of his legacy and the legacy of Paul Robeson and Marian Anderson and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and other artists and activists and thought leaders that uh, paved the way for us and, and gave us opportunity to articulate ourselves and um, articulate our own authenticity. And also, it was founded because my father said, I don't want to be a beggar anymore. I don't want to have to keep asking for money anymore for this movement. We have to find a way to self-sustain. So we solicit the support, participation, donation of artists, thought leaders, and celebrities in partnership with grassroots organizations to shine a light on very specific issues. We focus on four main issues. We focus on mass incarceration, immigration, income disparity, and we took on the overall banner of violence because we felt there were so many other issues that we wanted to uh, be able to address and to respond to. And if we had listed them all, people would suggest that we weren't focused. So we decided, you know what, let's just take on violence. That'll cover so many different things. Um, we're three years old. We just last weekend did one of our largest uh, presentations. We did a two-day social justice music and art festival in uh, Chattahoochee Hills, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta, where we were able to get the participation of Carlos Santana, Common, Macklemore, John Legend, Dave Matthews, Estelle, Jesse Smollett, Aja Monet, who you saw, was one of our um, beautiful poets who came, Sonia Sanchez, Angela Davis, Brian Stevenson, Rashad Robinson, who spoke earlier. So we have a tremendous amount of crossover and how we work with um, Campaign for Black Male Reimagine and Achievement. And um, Sankofa has got a lot of ongoing um, work that we're doing and the way in which we're responding to uh, activists and, and thought leaders on the ground. We were part of some of the first responders in Ferguson and in Baltimore. We have a sister organization called the Gathering for Justice and out of that was birthed the Justice League, the New York, New York Justice League, that did a 250 mile march from Staten Island and the place of Eric Garner's murder to the steps of the Capitol in Washington, D.C. And we supported that. We were helped to bring artists to that. And we're very excited about the work that we're doing. And we could use your support, certainly. And you can find us at www.sankofa, S-A-N-K-O-F-A dot O-R-G. Thank you. Brief by comparison. <laughs> I, I hope to have a bio like that someday. Uh, my name is Jamila Lemieux. I am a writer, I am an editor, and currently I am the vice president of news and men programming for Interactive One, uh, which is part of the Radio One Inc. family, uh, bookended, of course, by Radio One and TV One. Until quite recently, I was the senior editor at Ebony Magazine, where I served for about five years. And as a writer and editor, I have covered issues of race, gender, and sexuality. Uh, in my prior role, I was very proud to support the work of the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. So when we had the opportunity to come out here today and support this event, we hopped on it right away and we look forward to building a relationship between Interactive One and our properties with this organization, the organizations that made today possible and supporting Black Male Reimagined for years to come. Um, my name is Salamisha Tillett. I'm a professor of English and Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so I study and teach on uh, gender, sexuality, pop culture, um, and I'm currently working on a book on Nina Simone, um, Black Rage and Nina Simone, I guess would be more specific. Um, my other hat, which is related, uh, is um, I co-founded a nonprofit called A Long Walk Home uh, with my sister Shahrazad Tillett. And the mission of A Long Walk Home is to use art to empower young people um, and to end violence against girls and women. Um, another 
part of my biography that I'm, um, I share quite freely and, and is part of my journey, I think, here today and impacts all of my, my writing and my activism is I'm a rape survivor. I'm a, a survivor of college sexual assault. And so we began a long walk home um, as a way of, of thinking about and, and using art to help me heal, but then also to help other survivors of, of sexual violence heal. Um, and the organization has transformed into working with young people, um, particularly in Chicago, and especially with uh, African American girls who live at the intersection of various forms of violence, so gender-based violence, uh, gun violence, um, state violence, uh, and we uh, have programming to empower young people, um, to, and particularly African American girls, to kind of be uh, on the forefront of social movements, but also um, find resources um, for themselves and, for, and to advocate for other girls and young people in their communities. So I think black feminism and art and activism is uh, one of the kind of central tenets of, of everything I do. Um, and so I'm just honored to be on this stage with you all. Um, as well as be in the space to think through what's the relationship between kind of black feminism and how we imagine or reimagine uh, black masculinity. Thank you. Um, I'm Simone Lee and I'm um, uh, Rashid's um, wife. Rashid is my best friend. Um, and so I've been aware of Rashid's work for a long time. Um, and have been really encouraged by it. Um, I always feel like I'm the other side of the coin because all of my work is um, kind of about, concerned with, interested in um, black women. Um, and um, for the most part, I make sculpture and video. Um, and I was making a video with Rashida. We were collaborating and actually um, Arthur Jaffa was shooting it um, on July 20th, and Rashid um, said to me, I, he was talking about um, Blackout for Humanity, is it? For Human Rights. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, you know, we have a lot of artists and Blackout for Human Rights, but visual artists aren't doing anything. Um, and so um, that really concerned me. Um, I've never really considered, and I still don't consider myself an activist, um, but it did seem to me that we weren't, well, at least I wasn't, and there actually are a lot of visual artists that are doing work for Black Lives Matter, but I certainly wasn't reflecting the way I felt, even the way we felt that day, because that was like soon after uh, Philando Castile died. Um, so, I um, just made a Facebook post on uh, Bad News Women, which is a group, uh, kind of a private group for black women artists. And I have worked in New York for about 25 years. We lived for 25 years and worked very actively for the last 10 years in, uh, in the art world. Um, and after I sent out that message, what happened is really dramatic and, I, and I'm still processing it but 128 women came together and had an event at the New Museum. Um, we, had, we took over the entire New Museum, so we covered the facade um, with a sign that said Black Women Artists for Black Lives Matter. We, um, I don't think it was completely planned this way, but uh, a performance that lasted for four hours happened. Um, we took over the theater and had a, um, a digital screening of different images of black joy combined with the actual artwork of the artists who were involved with an installation that Alyssa Blunt Moorhead, who's also here today, um, installed. We had like the best artists in New York um, all come together and work collaboratively. And we also had one of the most important museums in New York offer us their space. Um, and it was amazing. Um, and so this photograph, I see the photograph here, but I don't see the photograph there. Is anyone seeing this photograph? Oh, you just saw it. Um, so um, that is Fatima White and her grandmother, who's also um, an artist and a designer um, at a moment where um, we were taking a break from the performance. 
Um, and I, I really love this photo because it's so emblematic of the kind of um, sincerity and um, genuine feeling that I uh, experienced that day that I rarely see in the art environment. Um, and so I'm still processing um, what happened that day, what it means, what I should do now in the future. Um, and it was just a very particular experience to feel like I just opened a door and this thing flew in and happened. And so I was really um, interested in coming here today to um, see the work of um, my colleagues and people who um, I would esteem to be like um, and see how they're handling um, the situation that we're in now. While we're all up here, I have something I'd like to raise for dialogue. Um, I appreciate that this final moment, I know it's been a long, this was a very full room earlier, it's a long day, so thank you to those of you who held out to see us, I understand. We, we had a panelist who had to catch a train and, and couldn't make it. Um, but even with re regardless of what the room looks like now and who's up here, I really appreciate that we are not inviting feminism to this space at the close of the day. And as an observer, I feel that feminist thought, feminist people were present throughout the program. And I think that's one of my great concerns with the amount of space our community has given to the cause of black men and boys. You know, because, and then we've talked about this at length many times, you know, some of the things that black women and girls need and the data says that we also need these resources and that at times we have not gotten them. But our black men and boys absolutely need them too. It's just that we also need them. But what I so appreciate about this moment, this day as a moment, but also the work of the organizations that put it together that the focus on affirming black men and boys is not in the absence of affirming black women and girls and also it includes teaching them how to engage with respect understand you know support black women and girls and so i guess i'd like to hear a little bit more from the three of you or whoever you know feels up to answering you know what that looks and feels like for you in the world of doing work for black men and boys how do we ensure that there's something that's coming out of it that it's not trickle down liberation right it's, it's they were also inviting these folks to support us yeah um, i guess i'll give a, an example um, from the work that we do, because we do work with girls primarily, um, and so the, you know there could be seen there could be seen as attention or a deficit of resources. One group's being paid attention to, while the other one's suffering. Um, but from our work and w what we found is, we do think of at least girls in Chicago being hyper vulnerable um, and hyper invisible, right? And so their vulnerability is um, made worse because no one's paying attention to the ways in which they experience this, this vulnerability and, and this the kind of violence they experience. And at the same time, what we found is by empowering girls, it, the girls then in some ways pull the young boys. And we work on really difficult issues of gender-based violence and dating violence and domestic violence and, and topics that people experience um, pretty almost unanimously, um, and yet feel a deep stigma or taboo about expressing and, and, and recovering from. So I guess from my work, I, this, the tension exists mostly um, from those who are giving out resources, right? The, or it's fostered by people who are, who gives the funding? Uh, what kind of media coverage is going to be paid to a particular event? Um, who's going to be put into a position of, of leadership? So it's not from the, the young people necessarily themselves, and so I guess I use that as a, a model, right? If we empower young girls and then they also are there to help and work with young boys, that to me is a more liberating frame than the one that we've kind of inherited from all these different institutions that we participate in or that define what good work, good activism, um, what's worthy of funding and things like that. So I guess for me, it's always if you use the young people as the center, uh, and then you use the most vulnerable uh, as the leader, 
then you actually have a, a, like a expansion of resources and, and, and an endless possibility for change as opposed to a deficit model. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, oh, and I also wanted to say that that photograph was taken by Madeline Hunt Ehrlich. Um, the way I've been thinking, I've been thinking all day about um, why I'm here and, and what um, I have to offer, and I, I don't think I, I didn't. I'm just trying to process now what you're you're um, asking me, which is um, what I would expect or what I'm inviting um, black men to do and support. Um, mostly today, I've been thinking about how much um, I need a safe space and I need um, moments where. Um, I can gather and just think about the needs and concerns of black women. And so I feel like um, my work really mirrors the kind of work that Rashid does. And I would just ask that people respect that um, because I just see um, more and more and more. And this is something that we experience in the art world where there's not really a lot of tolerance for our ideas. Um, we're not in an environment where most people understand our scholarship. Um, so I can't talk about like Hortense Spillers or anything like that in my, um, amongst my colleagues in art, amongst my, and um, I'm not able to really go deep in the ways that I would like to without um, having these moments where I really separate and focus on black women. And so um, I would just say that I support Rashid's work because um, I anticipate the need for it more and more in my own life. Um, I, you know, I, I work around men all day long, and uh, there are very few uh, women that work with me. I have one woman who works w with me, thank goodness. Um, and I, I think men are awesome. Uh, I think that um, I think that so many of us, men and women included, are very misguided with a misconception of who we are and um, what our contribution is or should be based upon our gender. And, uh, you know, there's just a really long learning curve for us all because, uh, you know, I can't group all women into one group, but I can't group all men into one group. and. I think there's some men who, who understand and, and respect the feminine and understand the, the, the equality, the human beingness in us. And I think there's others who, you know, with their either early childhood conditioning or old tapes centuries later, um, we have just bought into sort of the hype of who we are. Uh, media plays a huge role in um, sort of either desensitizing or sensitizing us to who we are and how we should be and what role we should play. And, um, and I'm kind of oh, so tired <laughs> of having to, um, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think about this presidential uh, election. I, I think about um, so many ways in which we just walk through the world and often have to explain ourselves if we are angry about something and how we're looked at as bitches as opposed to just a person who's really powerful and strong convictions about what they feel. Um, I'm tired of, of, of that and, and I, I no longer care if someone thinks I'm a bitch anymore. <laughs> you know, it's like um, that's their, more their problem. And um, Another example of this, for instance, that is for so long, violence against women was a woman's issue. And well, no, it's not. It's a man's issue. Uh, it's the man that has the issue and is perpetuating the violence. And therefore, it is a man's issue um, that women are, you know, need to certainly deal with and hope we can educate. I think the campaign for black male reimagine and achievement is critical. I think it is a critical space that we as women need to support and hold because it is a space where the invitation of learning, the invitation of tolerance, the invitation of patience, the invitation of, of um, really recognizing yourself um, is in that space. And I think it's important for us to hold that space. But I also will echo that um, you know, we need a campaign for black women achievement and black women reimagining. 
Um, I think there's so much that we need to reimagine in general about our cultures, about our work, about um, how we um, how we identify as human beings, and um, and we should find a way to have a community of partners, regardless of gender, or race, socioeconomic stability, um, where we support one another. Uh, but I, I do work around men all the time, and I do find it to be sometimes a space that I find really difficult to to um, to be in and and emerge from. Something that I guess. No, go ahead. Okay. Something I think about often, particularly around events like this or some of the organizations that were involved, were there a campaign for black female achievement? And to be fair, there are lots of organizations that are dedicated specifically to affirming black women and girls in ways that the partner organizations of the campaign do. So it's, it's not that we're without any resources whatsoever. But say, say there, was a, there was a parallel organization and you could fill this room twice right, with black women, and I often wonder, knowing, and, and the, the, many of the women in my life are hardcore feminists, and then the professional circles I travel in, you know, the, the women around me, to my left, to my right, myself, we're feminists. We show up for things like this, not just showing up for men in our daily lives, but we show up for these events, we watch the documentaries, we read the books, we write the articles, we, you know, we address the individual police killings, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And one painful, and this came up with a few of the women I spoke to today, one really painful thing for me that I'd like for you all to maybe reflect on if you're comfortable, is knowing that were there that exact organization. And there are a few that I name and I won't, um, out of respect, but knowing some of the work that they've done to try and, and bring black men, or just to say, hey, we're doing this thing, it's a day about black women and girls, will you come? And so knowing that the leadership of this organization, would, would, would Sean and Rashida been there? Sure. But would you be able to bring out just young, interested, activist, engaged men by the droves uh, in the way that women show up? And I think it's gotten a lot better. You all saw the panel with Darnell and Michael and, and Preston and, and just the amazing work that and Jamil, that they have done in particular, you know, and Antique. But again, I feel, it still feels to me like there's this small group that has said we live and breathe intersectionality, we believe in gender equity, we support our sisters, we support all black people, all black lives actually do matter to us, but that we still have a very long way to go into getting the sort of buy-in we need from a lot of our brothers. So I guess um, a couple of things, because we all think about this a lot, so, um, but I guess, uh, what does it mean to have a kind of explicit anti-racist feminist practice? Um, and I guess one thing I want to say before that is that even though I think we have a lot of organizations and groups that are committed to, not a lot, but to black girls, I don't think we have a lot of social justice organizations. So we have like, you know, what we can think of as girl empowerment organizations, things that make you feel good about your self-esteem, which is a political project, but it may not be an organization or groups that are getting girls to understand the way in which their bodies, black girls in particular, are, is kind of being overly determined by all of these external forces and how they can then push back against that. That's a different thing. So I just want to say there's something to me different about social justice versus empowerment, which the two are connected, but they're not necessarily the same. And then I guess the second thing to your larger question, um, you know, uh, this, is, this always struck me as fascinating with Black Lives Matter and then Say Her Name because we have ostensibly a, you know, a movement that started launched by black queer women, you know, as, we, as we say, um, and yet there had to be a kind of pushback, an internal pushback within the movement to claim the ways in which black women um, and girls are victims of state violence. And so I don't, you know, I think black feminism to me, and this is what I think is both its beauty, but also the challenge, is that there's always a lag time, like things have to catch up to black feminism. And I think black feminism is prophetic. I think it's always vanguard, it's always forward looking, and it's because it's so deeply radical at, at, its, at, at its best. And so everyone else is trying to figure out, how do you think about like gender and sexuality and class and race and, I don't know, nationality all at the same time. I mean, it seems impossible for people to actually kind of live with all of these things in a way that I think black feminism kind of always forces us to do. And I guess the last thing um, I would say is, 
I've been in so many spaces. Last year, uh, I was part of a wonderful uh, committee um, of, of black women um, who sponsored a, a conference at Columbia University um, on black girlhood. And it wasn't on black women, it was on black girls. Um, and I've always found it so striking that when you try to talk about black girls, Every, it's like this thing that no one can stay with for more than like 30 seconds. Um, because it's always a question about, well, what about this group? Or what about this group? Or what about this group? Uh, and so for me, it's really important to figure out what happens kind of psychologically. Like, why can't we see here um, value their lives? Um, what is it, what causes us to be so distracted um, from their importance? Um, and then how does that then limit us as a people um, uh, and, and keep us in this kind of cycle of you know, oppression, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just my quick three points there, because <laughs> I see the, the clock counting us down here. So. We have uh, three and a half minutes. Does anyone want to ask a question? One question? Anyone? To any of us? To, to, yes. Did everyone hear that? What, as black women working in the ways in which we do, what does black liberation look like, mean to us? Look like, mean to us. What does black liberation mean to us? Um, for me, it means that I can go back to my studio and make sculpture um, um, and not feel that um, I, you know, am ignoring like, um, this parade of black death mm -hmm. and not doing anything about it. Um, when I don't have to um, have that concern, I will feel um, that I have been liberated. Um, black liberation, what does that mean to me? Um, peace, uh, beauty, love, tradition, ritual, good food, laughter, uh, family. Um, it means freedom for everyone. If black people are liberated and free, everyone will be. Uh, um, you know, liberation also is a mindset. I feel, I think there's the literal, no doubt, but I also feel there's the mindset. And um, black liberation looks like, very along the lines of what you said, no longer having to feel either the obligation or the passion, the will and desire to, or the need to, uh, to bring to light so, so many egregious violations around our disenfranchised communities. The end to disenfranchisement, I guess, is a black liberation. Um, well, I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old, so on a kind of just practical level, it, it means that they can become their fullest self, um, selves. Um, but it also means for me that children who look like them and children who don't look like them um, have the possibility to live without violence. Um, and violence looks different depending on where you are in the world. Um, but most of it is both state sanctioned um, or kind of a result of some form of imperialism. So I, I think about my children as black children moving freely in, in, this, in this space, but also that their freedom is not contingent on the oppression of other people, um, as you said. So that's kind of what I think freedom means. Of course, I could quote Nina Simone, but I won't. Uh, she has a very good definition oh, herself. Wow. <laughs> She's so quotable. I think very quotable. I think it would be hard for me to add anything really to that, but I just love the idea of just being able to do the work that I love or to raise these children that we love so dearly as just people and not having to equip them with, you know, armor for surviving just the neighborhood, the walk home, the, you know, going to the doctor, going to the women's clinic, you know. Um, the idea that black people of all gender expressions, of all sexual orientations, of all backgrounds could simply be, and that no one would challenge their right to be on the basis of their identity. Thank you. Oh, thank there's you. one more. Okay.
Mothers Against Guns. Amen. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all so much.